I'm going to be talking about praxeology. Uh, there are some people who wonder uh, why do we have to study praxeology like when they read uh, Mises' Human Action, the first 140 pages, so it seems very difficult. They say, why do we have to bother with this difficult material? Well, one thing is if you really study it well and you get to know it, then you'll be able to open a praxeology store. <laughs> but at, actually, what I want to talk about today is principally, uh, as I say, people find this, the, the praxeological method very difficult to understand. What I'm going to try to show you is that it it's actually isn't very difficult. It's quite easy to follow. It's a common sense method of proceeding. And it's people think it's difficult because we have all these, people have introduced all these philosophical terms, uh, the analytic, synthetic, the synthetic a priori. There are all sorts of objections that logical positivists have raised to various points about uh, Praxeology as Mises practiced it, but most of these, in my opinion, are unnecessary complexities. If we grasp the essence of what's involved, it's very simple. Now, there's some people who are very insistent on using certain terms. Say they say, "Give me the synthetic a priori" or "Give me death," but <laughs> I'm going to be trying to show that we can avoid a lot of that complexity. But before I do that, I'd like to just say a little bit about what are some of the basic principles in praxeology. Now, praxeology is the science of human action. According to Mises, uh, from thinking about the concept of action, or Rothbard has, from think, has it from thinking about the axiom that human beings act, we can deduce a whole body of truth, uh, propositions that are very important ones that are, we can establish the economics just from deduction from the principle of the, uh, this uh, concept of action. And Economics is the best developed branch of praxeology. Now, the odd thing there is that uh, people will talk about other branches of praxeology, for example, a possible science of military conflict or game theory, which is not the same as the game theory of mathematics. So they talk about these other branches, but nobody ever does anything with these other branches. So Praxeology, in effect, is economics. There are possibly other branches, but nobody uh, has developed those. And the method used in praxeology, this deductive method that I've already spoken about, uh, differs very much from the method common among mainstream, mainstream economists, and I'll be going into what the main differences are. So, as I say, that praxeology begins either from the concept of action, as Mises took it, or the axiom that man acts. Now, by action, we just mean any kind of purposeful behavior, such as, say, you're coming here to uh, attend this lecture would be an example of, of an action. You have an end to or goal to come to the lecture and your means, you walk in and sit down. We could think of all sorts of other actions like you're getting, deciding to leave the lecture. That's what I would do if I were in your place, but fortunately for me, I'm not. So we could, any action is any sort of purposeful behavior. It usually involves some movement of the person's body. You're acting, you're moving your body in a certain way to attend, to attain an end. It doesn't have to. We could think of examples of action that don't. For example, supposing I said, uh, 
all those who agree with me, please signify this by remaining seated. So nobody stood up, so you've all agreed with me, you've acted. So that would be an example of an action that doesn't involve the use, the movement of the body, but it, it's, again, an action It's using a means remaining seated to attain the end, signifying agreement. And Mises and Rothbard make the quite remarkable claim that from this basic concept or axiom, with a few supplementary postulates, such as that uh, there's a variety of goods and services and uh, uh, leisure is a good, labor has disutility. The whole science of praxeology can be deduced. So you're starting with this basic uh, concept of action, then you're deducing all of economics from that. Now, the kind of deduction is not, is what I call here material rather than formal. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in logic, if you've taken uh, modern symbolic logic or mathematical logic, it's, the reasoning proceeds formally. You do it as somewhat like mathematical equations. You have symbols and then you get rules for deducing one step from another step, but this isn't the way praxeology proceeds. It's an ordinary language method of deduction where you have to understand the meaning of each step that as you're proceeding. So it's not formal, it's your understanding what's going on in each step as you're going through it. Now, understanding what you're going on what's going on is something that many mainstream economists don't like very much. They <laughs> like the formal deduction, but this is the way it's done in Austrian economics. Uh, I'll just give a few examples of praxeological reasoning. And if you say, how do we know these things? Again, by thinking about action. And when we think about action, we realize that these propositions are true. One of them is that every action uses a means to achieve an end. This is just what we mean by an action. So every action uses a means uh, to achieve an end. Then every action is a choice between alternatives. We, we're not determined to do just one action. We have a choice among alternatives. And we would always choose the alternative we value highest. Now, one other one I'll just mention, I didn't list it on the, the slide. It's very important. It is in an exchange, you always value what you're getting more than what you're giving up. So in exchange, there's a double inequality in that the person you're exchanging with would have the reverse valuation. Now that one, incidentally, or not so incidentally, is especially important in the history of economic thought because for a long time, ever since Aristotle wrote, and you get this in the uh, classical economist David Ricardo, and you get it in Karl Marx, the view was that in an exchange, there's an equality that if I say exchange one apple for one orange with somebody else, uh, one apple equals one orange. There's any things exchange have to be equal. So it's real one of the basic contributions of the subjective theory of value of the 1870s is that we don't assume this. We're assuming that. On the on contrary, we realize that an exchange involves a double inequality. Now, you might raise an objection here, which is something like this. Uh, isn't it obviously true that an exchange involves this inequality, that if you exchange something, you want what you're getting more than what you're giving up? So if it's so obvious, why did everybody from Aristotle to Marx 
talk about equality, where, I mean, whatever you say about Aristotle or Marx, you can't say they were stupid. So how did they miss this? And what we have to realize there, I don't think they would have denied that an exchange involves this kind of inequality, but they would have said that that point, the subjective value or what they call the use value, isn't relevant to determining the exchange value, why the goods exchange at a certain rate. They said to, assume, to figure that out, you have to assume equality. And it's the great contribution of the Austrian, the subjective theory, that you don't need that from the subjective valuations of people which uh, have this feature of double inequality. You can get an account of of prices. You don't need the assumption of equality. Now, uh, when uh, I said that an action involves the use of means to achieve an end, a means is whatever an actor thinks will help him attain his goal. Uh, it's entirely a subjective matter. Uh, for example, supposing somebody hates another person, he thinks that making a, a small doll of that person, sticking pins in the doll, will have bad effects on the person. Uh, that would be, uh, he's uh, sticking pins in the doll as a means to his end, even though we would think that that's not a good way to do it or Actually, may, maybe it is. I don't know. I've never tried it. <laughs> you never know, I suppose. But uh, whether, whether that, it, it, even if it isn't, even if it impress, even if it's in fact a silly w way of doing things, it's still a means to uh, uh, the end as the person conceives it. So it's whatever the person considers a means is a means. Uh, for him. And I give here a quotation from Mises. Uh, in dealing with prices, economics does not ask what things are in the eyes of other people, but only what they are in the meaning of those intent on getting them. So this would apply both to the ends and means. I think that's a, a quotation I think, from uh, Epistemological Problems of Economics by Mises in the English translation, page 93, I think. So, again, when we're trying to explain an action, what's important is what the actor prefers. Say, if I were trying to explain why you came to this lecture, I would have to deal with what was going on in your minds when you decided to come. What would be important was the values as you conceive them, what you thought you were getting out of coming to the lecture. And praxeology isn't a, a normative discipline. It isn't telling you what you should choose. It isn't saying you should, in some ultimate sense, come to this lecture or not come to this lecture. It's just identifying what's given it's trying to explain an a actions through the particular values that you have. Now, we can, in economics, evaluate certain means as suitable or not suitable. For example, if, say, someone wants, a government, say, wants to uh, end unemployment, we could say, is it a suitable means to do this to pass minimum wage laws? And we would be able to explain why it wasn't. But that would be a statement economics can make. We say, if this is your goal, this is or isn't a suitable means. But we wouldn't be able to evaluate in economics an ultimate end. That my ultimate end would be some goal that you have that isn't a means to some further goal. It would just be, I want this, this is my ultimate end. So economics can say nothing about that. Here I think we have to avoid 
a misstep that some people think, well, the reason economics can't say anything about ultimate ends is that nobody can rightly say anything about ultimate ends. They're purely subjective. That's just what people have or don't have. That would be, there's certainly people who have that view. Mises had that view, I think. But that's just, a, that's a particular philosophical view. It's not part of praxeology. All that we have in praxeology is that it doesn't, praxeology doesn't make claims about ultimate ends. It just says, can evaluate means to ends, but not an ultimate end. An ultimate end, again, is one that isn't a means to a further end. Uh, now, one essential point is that praxeology isn't about particular actions that people do. I've given it the example of coming to the lecture, this lecture. So that wouldn't be something that you would study in praxeology is why did you come to this lecture? Uh, that wouldn't be addressed in praxeology. That would be a particular action that you did, and that would be more a matter of psychology. I hope not abnormal psychology, but it would be part of psychology. So what we're doing, not we're not considering uh, particular actions, but rather the form of an action or what's true of any action just as such, just because it's a, an action, the general uh, features or structural features that any action has. And because it's, praxeology is confined to these general structural features, uh, it doesn't make quantitative claims. Uh, for example, uh, we can show through prax praxeology that lowering the price of a good will, other things being equal, result in an increase in the quantity of the good which is demanded. Say, if you lowered the price of, uh, of a trip to Europe to $5, air, air trip to Europe to $5, there'd be a vastly increased demand, very likely. But we couldn't say through praxeology how much the quantity demanded would increase. So all we would be able to do is identify general features of the action, not particular details. Now, a key principle of praxeology is that only individuals act. How do we know that? Well, we just think about action, we realize that individuals are the actors, not larger groups. For example, suppose we say, uh, we can talk about nations and classes existing, but they only act through individuals. For example, supposing we say that uh, the America declared war on Japan December 8th, 1941. So, if we're trying to analyze that statement, we would mean that uh, certain people in the U.S. Congress passed a, a resolution, and as a result of that, other people did other things, and the U.S. was at war with Japan. But it wouldn't be, we wouldn't analyze it. There's some separate entity, the United States or Japan, that it, that are acting apart from the individual. It's only the, uh, the, the action of these collective groups are to be analyzed by the actions of individuals. Uh, the uh, one thing, again, another point to avoid confusion, some people might take the view, well, only individuals exist. There aren't any nations or classes or larger groups, or they exist only in a metaphorical sense. And there are some people who hold that view, but that isn't one that's uh, part of praxeology. That, again, is a particular view, the philosophical view that some people have, that the view is rather only individuals act. Uh, 
So you, it's perfectly in order to say if you want that nations and classes exist in the full non-metaphorical sense, it's just they don't act. Uh, now one, one objection that was raised to methodological individualism, it's an interesting one, I didn't put this on the slide, but I think it was raised by uh, Bob Nozick in his article on Austrian methodology, which I think you can find in his book, uh, Socratic Puzzles. And he said, well, if you have this reductionist view that n action, nations and classes are to be, actions of nations and class, classes are to be analyzed in terms of individuals who are acting, well, why don't you go further? Why don't you try to analyze human actions in terms of uh, atoms and molecules? Why do you stop the reduction there? And I think what's wrong with that objection is it isn't the methodological individualism isn't a principle based on uh, a reductionist view saying we should try to reduce theoretical entities to the le lowest possible level. It's rather what we get from looking at the concept of action. So we're talking about individuals acting because they're the ones who act. Atoms and molecules don't act. We can, or if they do, they're not telling us about it. <laughs> anyway, so we can, uh, by just thinking about the concept of action, we realize that the principle of methodological individualism is true. And I, you might think, again, that this principle sounds obvious, but when uh, Mises was writing, when he, remember he wrote Human Action, came out in 1949, but there'd been a German edition in 1940, in, when Mises was formulating his views in the early part of the 20th century, there were people who denied methodological individualism, like the, one of his rivals was a professor of economics at the University of Vienna called Ottmar Spahn, and he was one who denied that. He thought the collective was prior to the individual. It was the collective that acted. So there were people who denied this. So now I want to... Uh, go into what I said was the main point I want to get across to you in the lecture, trying to explain the basis, how do we know what I've been saying about action or what the other lectures are telling you is true. Uh, I mean, I can't say like the professor, uh, you know, had, was questioned by the student who said, uh, take down what I give you or get out. I have to try to show why the why we should accept this these views about these points about praxeology? How do we know they're true? So in I want to contrast the way praxeology proceeds with mainstream e economics, the neoclassical economics. Most economists today follow a method like that used in the physical sciences. So. What uh, happens in the physical sciences is that the scientists will con construct a theory that makes quantitative production, pr predictions. He'll start off with certain axioms and definitions, and he'll have a deduce propositions from them, and then he'll derive predictions, and then he can say, uh, test out are these predictions confirmed or falsified by experience? So that's the way uh, most economists want to proceed. They say there is a place for deduction in economics, but it's really in elaborating the theory. We, construct, we get a formal model, and then we try to see whether that model is true or not by testing it out. So the supporters of this way say the way this method of proceeding where we construct the models and then test them out is the way that science has progressed. This is from the scientific revolution of Galileo and Kepler and later Newton. This is the way science has proceeded and 
if economics wants to be a science, it has to proceed in the same way. But the Austrian response to this is that, unlike the physical sciences, we're not limited to external observation. Say in the physical sciences, we can uh, see physical objects using instruments. We can get, uh, say, see molecules. We can go further. We can see certain very, very small particles. We can, we're, but whatever we do, we're relying on certain kinds of observations. We don't really know how these physical particles are going to, what they're going to do other than by watching them or seeing what they do using the, with the help of the various instruments we use in doing this. But in human action, we grasp knowledge, we grasp action from the inside. We ourselves are actors. We know that we act. This is just something we know from experience. Now, some people like to point out, and this is, I think, quite a valid point, that suppose somebody denied that, suppose somebody said, I don't act, that that would be an action itself. So you're rather, if you deny that you're acting, you're rather refuting yourself. I think this is an entirely valid point, but the key to the understanding why, how we know we act is that we just know it, for, we, we're aware of our own actions. This other point about that we're refuting ourselves, if you, someone denied that he actually be refuting himself, is I say a valid point, but it doesn't, if say if somebody was skeptical about acts, well, somebody said, I don't think we act, and you gave the person that point, that this argument you know, that you're refuting self would probably shut the person up, but it wouldn't ex really get to the source of whatever was bothering the person, why he thought he uh, wanted to deny people. Act. To do that, you have to look at, uh, just think, and you realize that you do act. I remember, uh, I had a conversation once with Bob Nozick, the great Harvard philosopher in around March 1980, and he made this, it made a very big impression on him. He made this point about this, this kind of self-refutation argument that he thought it was all right, but it you, doesn't really address what the problem was that the skeptic is raising. So if you want to be complete, you have to be able to do that. Now, as I say though, the supporters of this mainstream method say the physical sciences advance through this method of having a formal model and then uh, getting predictions from it and testing whether these predictions are true. Suppose they say their method is the only way to gain knowledge about the world. They say, Look, you can talk, you praxeologists can talk about this deductive method if you want, but that won't get you anywhere. Then they're going to get into trouble because they're making a philosophical claim. They're saying this is the only way you can get knowledge, but that isn't something they've arrived at by modeling and testing things they haven't made. So, there, how is it that we're supposed to be able to know? this alleged fact about the world, if the claim is true, how would we know that? Now, I might raise the objection against me. Well, I, didn't I just say that this kind of self-refutation argument doesn't answer the skeptical worry? But that's perfectly all right with me as long as it shuts them up. I'd be very happy about it. So uh, now we come to the key question. Uh, how do we know that the principles of praxeology are true? And this is where I want to claim we have the simple answer, is that the action axiom is obviously true. We know that we act, and it doesn't require support from anything else. It's just something that's obviously true. And uh, then we know if you, one of the wonderful things about deduction is if you start with a true premise, whatever you deduce from it is also true. So we've started with something that's obviously true. 
then if we're correct, we've deduced other things from it. So what we have is obviously true. As Bertrand Russell once said, there are two, uh, two methods of reasoning, deductive and bad. So this is how we know praxeology is true. Now, as I say, I think this is very simple. I just said, well, action axiom is obviously true, but a lot of, it, it isn't the only example of an obviously true statement. We can come up with many of these. For example, uh, I have a body, other people exist, the earth is larger than I am. And I want, I, in philosophy, these are sometimes called Moorean facts after the great British philosopher G. Moore, who was a professor at Cambridge uh, in the early 20th century through the, uh, around the 1940s, was stressed these very much. He thought, there, he pointed out there are certain things we just know to be true, that's it. We know them to be true. And this is, if you realize this, then you can you see why that there are this kind of truth, and that the action axiom is one of these truths, then you can see how we know that praxeology is true. Uh, so when I say these truths are obviously true, they're known to be true, what I'm what I had entailed by that is no further observation will overthrow them. Just by thinking about them, we realize it's true. Uh, for example, suppose I say, I exist, and no doubt, unfortunate fact, but a fact nevertheless, at least for now, that isn't going to be overthrown by future observation. And future observation show that sometime in future I won't exist, but no future observation could overthrow the fact that I now exist. And now here we come to one of these terms I mentioned that lead to confusion, a priori truth. One way of defining an a priori truth or characterizing it, and this is one adopted by the great uh, philosopher uh, W. V. O. Quine, in, is that an a priori truth is one that's immune from, is known to be true and is immune from, from being overthrown by anything else. Once you grasp it's true, that's it. Now, Quine pointed this out, said that's what he meant by a priori truth, but he didn't think there were any. He thought that everything could be, whatever it was, could be overthrown by future observation. But it isn't clear, at least to me, why we should accept that view. For example, if I say two plus two equals four, that isn't, it's not going to happen that there's some future observation that will overthrow that. Uh, there was one uh, story, which I'll give you, that uh, Alfred, North Whitehead, who was a great uh, philosopher and mathematician who became a professor at Harvard, had a lot of influence on Quine, had the view that everything could be, was subject to being overthrown. And one of his students once asked him, do you think that it could turn out that two plus two doesn't equal four? And he answered, not for a long time. <laughs> uh, so uh, one idea that some people have is that a test, how do we know that there are these a priori, how do we know which are the a priori truths? That's the one. How do we know which are the principles that can't be overthrown by any future observation? Is they would say that there, the test for this is what's called a performative contradiction. For example, suppose I say, I exist is an a priori truth. So suppose I denied that, I said, I don't exist. So I could only say I don't exist if 
I did exist because otherwise I wouldn't be able to say anything. So in this notion of performative contradiction, it's that the idea of that denying the uh, truth shows that in fact it's true. I'm only able to deny the principle because the principle is true and my attempt to deny it shows that it's true. Now this, I think, again, it's it's very nice as far as it goes, but it isn't a criterion for a priori truth. There are a priori truths of which where this doesn't apply. For example, suppose I deny that two plus two equals four. Suppose I say two plus two equals five. I'm, say, a Keynesian economist. I say two plus two equals five. So it isn't clear that saying my saying that two plus two equals five shows that two plus two equals four, that my very attempt to say two plus two equals five shows that two plus two equals four. So this isn't in general a test for the a priori. Now, one objection probably occurred to you already is, isn't the claim about obvious truth that I made uh, vulnerable to objection. Uh, suppose, as this example some of you will know from taking philosophy class, uh, suppose I'm really a brain in a vat and I'm being manipulated by scientists to think I have a body. Wouldn't I be having exactly the same experiences as I have now? The, the thought experiment is set up, so I'm having I'm experiencing matters just as if I were giving, say, giving you this lecture now, but in fact, I'm not. I'm a brain in a vat being manipulated by scientists. So wouldn't, given that I have the same experiences, how could my claim to know that I have a body, which I say is obvious, how could that be immune to being overthrown by further observation? Now, one answer to this, and it was one that Moore took, is that uh, the, ar the, the obviousness of these truths is so direct that we would know any arguments against them are wrong, even if we can't show what's wrong with the argument. But I'm not going to pursue that because that's a philosophical claim. What's important here is that praxeology is not an attempt to answer the problem of external world skepticism, about skepticism about the external world. In this respect, praxeology is like the other sciences. I've been emphasizing differences between praxeology and the physical sciences. But in here, praxeology is like the physical sciences. Just as in physics, we wouldn't say, how do we know there any matter at all? How do we know there's, we talk about uh, subatomic particles, but how do we know that there, our observations are really telling us anything? Maybe these are all somehow imaginary. That isn't a question that would be addressed in physics. And similarly, uh, praxeology isn't concerned with skepticism about the external world. And it also isn't an attempt to solve the problem of other minds. The problem of other minds is, well, I know by, from my, I don't know my own thoughts, but I don't know your thoughts, or so it's claimed. I don't, I can't, according to some philosophers at any rate, I can't, I can just observe your bodies, but I don't know that you're actually thinking or have minds. Some people don't think that's the case. They think that, in fact, we can observe other people's thoughts. But suppose you didn't think that. And the question would be, how do I know that there are other minds? Again, that isn't a question addressed by praxeology. Praxeology is not about what's going on in my mind or your mind. It's about actions in the world. Now, the point I've made that there are certain truths that are such as the uh, action axiom, that are a priori in the sense that they can't be overthrown by any future observation, is in conflict with Karl Popper's famous falsifiability criterion for scientific statement. According to Popper, 
every scientific statement has to be capable of being shown false by some future observation. And if it is, if, if the statement is unfalsifiable, then it isn't a scientific statement. So you see what he's, Popper has done there, he's ruled out just by setting up this criterion, a priori, any a priori truths as being scientific because a scientific statement to him is one that can be, there's some observation that could show the statement false, but in an a priori truth, there's no future observation could show the statement's false. So it just, from the point, uh, praxeologists can say that Popper has made a question begging claim it's hardly an objection to a view that it couldn't possibly be false. At least I'm not thinking that. And in my opinion, one the greatest obstacle nowadays to sympathetic consideration of praxeology by economists is the influence of Popper, especially some of his followers who are called critical rationalists. Uh, I think they're uh, they're not very rational in my view, where they're critical is something else. So according to critical rationalism, they don't believe, and they take this quite literally, that people know anything. They think all we have is conjectures that are subject to testing, and they'll make statements. There are no good reasons to believe anything, or all arguments beg the question as I'm not making these things up, this is what they actually say. And so I'd say, uh, very well, if, they, if they're right, then there's no good reason to accept their view, and I don't accept it, so, <laughs> so much for them. And uh, Popperian views, although they're very popular among certain economists who are interested in methodology, but they're not too well accepted by mainstream philosophers of science. One of the principles that Popper had was he doesn't accept inductive reasoning, and most philosophers of scientists think that's implausible. Suppose I said I'm walking across the street and saying there's a lot of incoming traffic. So suppose I say, well, I'm not going to uh, walk in front of the cars because I had, that would be an example, I'd be killed. That would be an example of inductive reasoning. And according to Popper, we don't know that I wouldn't be killed. It's just a hypothesis. So most people find that rather implausible. Now, so far, I have to uh, get through this in a couple of minutes. I've said nothing about the distinction between analytic and synthetic a priori truth. And this has generated a lot of confusion. The logical positivists distinguish between two types of true statements, analytic and synthetic. And by analytic, they meant truths of meaning, such as all bachelors are male. And a synthetic truth is a truth about the world, such as bachelors are selfish. So the, pra the positivist argument then used this distinction against praxeology. They said, all a priori truths are analytic, and analytic truths consist of conventions about using words. So praxeology can't, can tell us nothing informative about the world, because to do that, you'd have to have synthetic a priori truths, but there aren't any. As Paul Samuelson said, there are no empirical a priori truths. And I'm running out of time, so I think I'll cover this in my lecture on Wednesday. On I'll just very briefly say we can challenge both premises of these arguments. Uh, first, why should we think that all a priori truths are analytic? Say, uh, what I exist doesn't seem to be an analytic truth, and truth. And besides, most concepts don't have precise definitions, so it's very hard to separate out any particular realm and say these are truths of meaning and these are truths of fact. So the whole positivist argument doesn't work. So I think at this point, uh, fortunately, I'm sure you wished I'd done this earlier, but I think I'll stop now and uh, 
we can now have lunch, which is almost as much fun as going through the problems of the logical positivist view of the a priori. <laughs>